Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of April 10th, 2023. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we explain why the House budget debate last week reminded us a lot of the old Jodie Foster body swap film, Freaky Friday. Second, we discuss why a recent op-ed by ICER economist Matt Berman hits the nail on the head about regressivity and reminds me at least of an important state fiscal advantage income taxes have over sales taxes. And third, we discuss the various parts of the recent oil tax proposals that appear to be moving forward. And now, let's join Michael. Brad, uh, we got things to talk about with you. We're going to start off with the weekly top three. Uh, Hollywood comes to mind when you look at the behavior and actions of the local legislature, and you've got some, you actually got some comparatives in mind, some movies. You got a, you're saying, and this all reminds you of something. What are we talking about here this morning? Well, the legislature, there, there was something that kept buzzing in my mind last week as I kept, you know, watching the legislature and watching the the minority floor amendments and and watching them hold out for, you know using PFD cuts to, to, to fund government. Uh, at the same time as we're seeing, uh, uh, Ben Carpenter's uh, sales tax bill, uh, over on the, over on the Republican side. And it finally dawned on me what it was. Um, some in the audience may not be old enough to remember this, but there was a movie back in the eighties called Freaky Friday that had Jodie Foster in it. And the premise of the movie was, uh, a daughter and a mother changed, uh, personalities or, or changed changed bodies, and Jody was the younger one, and she became she became you know the younger person in the older woman's body, and the older woman became an older woman in the younger person's body. They just they body shifted. A, a variation on that was Tom Hanks's Big uh, movie, Big in the '90s, where Hanks suddenly you know became a a, a boy in a in a in a man's body and, and right. trying to trying to go through. So there's this whole genre of movies that are, that are shifting, uh, right. pers- personality shifting, body shifting. And that's what the legislature um, is, is, has reminded me of. The Democrats traditionally say, tr- Democrats and independents traditionally say they're looking out for middle and lower income families, working Alaska families. A number of them ran, no doubt, no doubt encouraged by Ship Creek Group. A number of them uh, ran on the premise that, or on the on the campaign theme that they were going to fight for Alaska fam- working Alaska families when they got to the legislature, and they get to the legislature, and what they've been proposing to fund their their various programs are PFD cuts, which have the largest adverse impact on uh, on middle and lower income Alaska families, working Alaska families, and when I say middle. Uh, income Alaska families. I mean the full sixty percent of middle income Alaska families, upper middle, middle middle, and and lower middle uh, income Alaska families, working by anybody's definition, working uh, uh, families. Yet the yet the the Democrats who claim to be fighting for Alaska for these working Alaska families are the ones who proposed the fiscal measure that has the largest adverse impact directly on that group, directly on. On working Alaska families, the Republicans, on the other hand, are being comparatively reasonable. Um, they're trying to. I mean, uh, Ben Carpenter's proposal of a sales tax, uh, uh, while it doesn't go, is, isn't as flat as I would like to see it. Uh, nevertheless, is is something that has it's much less regressive than than PFD cuts. It has a much lower 
adverse impact on uh, disproportionate impact on middle and lower income Alaska families. So the legislature seems to have, you know, shifted, seems to the Republicans who are traditionally viewed as being the, the advocates of more regressive policies, more pro-business policies, less uh, pro-family policies. The Republicans have shifted into being the more reasonable, the more moderate uh, uh, of the fiscal approaches. And the Democrats who traditionally try to say that they're standing up for working Alaska families um, and they're going to you know, fight for and protect working Alaska, they've shifted into the, into the most regressive group. There's been this body shifting uh, that's going on between the two bodies. And, and you never, I never saw it as clearly as I did when I was watching the floor session with the, with Democrat after Democrat saying, Oh, we've got to, we got to cut the PFD, you know, Sarah Hannon saying, you know, free rides die hard. Right. Sort of, uh, sort I, of my favorite quote. Yeah. It's my favorite quote. Free rides die hard. Reminiscent what? of, uh, of, of uh, Natasha von Imhoff, Imhoff's uh, speech. Yeah, exactly. speech. I mean, it's just, I, it's just, I mean, we've had this body shifting and now we're going to have uh, the link you sent me this morning to Elise Galvin's uh, proposed, uh, proposed income tax um, is now we're going to have these, what some people call fig leaf bills, right? We're going to, they're going to, we're going to have these bills that say they're doing something, but they're not really doing anything. What, what Elise's bill would be is basically a small tax on the top 5%. The, the tax kicks in at 200,000 and above. Uh, in the Alaska di income distribution range, that's the top 5%. Um, so it would be a small tax, uh, small tax on the top 5%, uh, but it, it wouldn't raise much money. So it would still leave this hu huge hole in the budget, which following up on what the Democrats said last week on the floor would come from PFD cuts. So they, they will claim now, or she will claim, no doubt, that she is trying to be, you know, I'm, I'm in the game, you know, I'm trying to get more or, or less regressive tax approaches out there. Well, they're fig leaves. I mean, they're just, they're things that you can claim, things that you do claim are doing what you say they're doing, but they're not. They're really just, you know, uh, small increments uh, that you try to blow up into uh, into bigger things. So we're, we're going to see, a, uh, we'll, we'll likely see a number of these fig leaf bills from Democrats now as they try to sort of try to regain the 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 upper ground in this debate about regressivity uh but you know ben carpenter's bill is a fix i mean it's a it's a it's a full-on fix uh of uh of, of what's going on larry personally had a had an op-ed in the in the judo empire where he complained about ben carpenter's bill and it's just really i mean it's really odd to to read through this op-ed He's going on and on and on about how we ought to be funding things through PFD cuts. If PFD cuts are free money and or PFDs are free money, we ought to be funding it through PFD cuts. And then he starts complaining about the regressivity of, of Ben Carpenter's bill. And, right. and, and, and sales taxes are like, you know, five times, six times, seven times less regressive uh, in terms of their impact on middle and lower income Alaska families, less regressive than, than sales taxes. So it's just, I mean, the, the, the Democrats have really gotten themselves in a very odd situation that, that I'm not sure they know how to get out of. Uh, they're, it's like they're, they, they all discovered that they all discovered the term regressive and regressivity. And they're all, all of a sudden they're like, oh, we should use that all the time. <laughs> I mean, like we should use that. I mean, that's an amazing word. We should use that. Wait, you guys have been doing this the whole time. You had no idea what it was called. I mean, just all of a sudden. And they're still proposing to do it. I mean, they're they're still on top of uh, on on top of it, uh, uh, proposing to use PFD cuts. I mean, that was that was sort of the the underlying theme of the entire floor debate last week. It was use PFD cuts, fund fund this, but don't pay a PFD and let K through twelve uh, uh, go unfunded. Use PFD cuts to you know take P, take it out of the PFD in order to in order to fund this. And and translated into into fiscal terms, tax middle and lower income Alaska families uh, in order to in order to to fund K through twelve. It's just I, they don't. I don't think they grasp. I don't think they grasp the the position they've got themselves into. And I, and Ben's bill was I'm, I, I doubt if he intended it this way, but it was a brilliant a brilliant maneuver to really you know create this juxtaposition between what the what the Democrats want to rely on in terms of in terms of PFD cuts to fund government versus less regret, still regressive, but less, much, much, much less regressive proposal. If anybody could figure this out, you would think it'd be personally, but 
he uh, his op ed is just this screed against against uh, Ben's bill for being too regressive um, and and not uh, not solving the fiscal problem when really we ought to be solving the fiscal problem through uh, through PFD cuts. I, Come on, Brad. These people are so tone deaf. I mean, this last the article uh, in the AD, uh, in the ADN talking about the the, the overall budget bill. And then, you know, quoting minority members said it was not prudent to use savings to pay for core government services. What the, have you been asleep the last 10 years? I mean, these same people have drawn $14 billion out of savings, $15 billion out of savings to pay for core government services. And are like, oh, well, we shouldn't do that. Oh, that could. Oh, and that's regressive. Don't use that. Look, this can, can I mark it off on my calendar of the day? I found that word regressive. It's regret. I mean. <laughs> Like one of the said, like you're right. They have totally body swapped here and gone around the bend in the other direction. These these folks are not paying attention to lower and middle income Alaska families. They don't. They don't. Get, they just want to make sure that their programs and their stuff get paid for. And it doesn't matter what it is. And and it's very obvious that their sights and targets are set on that whole crowd, not just the Democrats, but the big government Republicans in the Senate are doing the same thing. They're setting their entire sights on the PFD. They want to eliminate it. They want to take all that free money and use it for the programs that they want. That's it. Yeah. Zach Fields is the poster child for all this. I mean, Zach Fields the one who's proposed to cut the PFD down to a thousand dollars because that's historically what it's been. Forget about inflation, forget about all that other stuff, but that's historically what it's been. I mean, he's the poster child. I, he, he clearly, he clearly is just trying to fund government in, in the most expeditious manner he can. The money's going through the legislature, the PFD money's going through the legislature's figures. So grab it while it's going through uh, and apply it to the government programs uh, that, that he favors. Um, and don't top, don't top the top 20, don't touch the top 20%. Don't touch his top 20% donors uh, right. uh, in the process right. or, or the, or the union donors. Don't, don't touch any of those donors. Um, uh, let's just take it out of the pockets of middle and lower income. Well, and you even see that with Galvin's bill because ostensibly the bill is about, uh, you know, the bill is about, uh, proposing an income tax that, you know, those with upper incomes will pay more, but then you find out that really, they're only paying uh, 2% on $50,000 worth of their income. If they make over 200,000, they pay 2% on 50,000. And so it's a thousand bucks. And you're like, wait a second. If, if you're really going after the top 20, if you're really going after the upper income, shouldn't it be a, oh no, no, it's capped. So don't worry about it. I mean, it is a, it is a fat, big, nothing burger. Like you said, it's a smoke screen. It only, if it only draws 2% from the top $50,000 of the, of the top income earners, then, it, it, I mean, a hundred million, maybe, maybe, uh, at that point. And then, you know, 20 bucks on a head tax for everybody else. That's, it's like, I'm going to do something. That's exactly and, what that is. And the 20 bucks itself is regressive, right? Because it's another yeah. head tax. That's the problem with, the, yeah. that's the problem with the PFD. The PFD is a head tax and head tax or head taxes are hugely regressive. So she's, she's proposing, let's get this right. She's proposing a very small, progressive tax on on 5% of the Alaska income and then leveling up the head tax on the on the remaining 95%. It's a I, it, they they don't maybe they do understand what they're doing. But but it's but it is it is it is manipulation it is uh, uh it, it's just it, it's nonsense. And then and then you have all that going on on the Democrat and independent side and then you have Ben Carpenter standing up Saying, okay, we got to fix this problem. One piece of this, one piece right. of the solution is we got to come up with uh, with uh, some revenues that are not PFD cuts. We got to come up with you know less regressive, less regressive tools to raise revenues. Yeah, Ben Carpenter looks like you know the Mister Adult in the in the in the room compared to compared to all the Democrats who are you know complaining about the regressivity of the of. Uh, 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 complaining about the regressivity of the sales tax bill. It's just, just, just doesn't make, just, uh, it makes for comedy. I mean, sort of like freaky Friday, the body swap, it makes for comedy, well, uh, it, but it certainly doesn't make for good fiscal policy. You got to laugh or you'll be smashing your face against the wall because you'd be so upset about it. I was already triggered before we even got started. This morning, <laughs> and this is, it's a hundred percent true. I mean, supposedly, and this is what I've been saying for a long time, supposedly, the Democrats are the politicians, the representatives of the little guy, 
right? I mean, they're supposed to be protected. I mean, that's the stereotypical, you know, we defend the poor and those who can't defend themselves quickly take their PFD. Um, you know, that's, I mean, that's what they're doing, right? I mean, that's the whole thing. I've, I have been shocked, shocked. I tell you that they have not been the ones that had the most vociferous, uh, vocal, uh, objection to the taking of the PFD because it's very obvious that when you have a family that makes $20,000 a year with two or three people and you take four or five thousand dollars out of their income by taking their PFD, that that's not a good thing. And yet they're like, well, but see, the problem is they're balancing it on their love for government. Well, we've got to have those government programs, we've got to have them, and there's no other way to pay for them. So you we'll just take it from you. Don't worry about it. You're paying for the program. You're using it. So we'll take we'll take it from you. That's the answer. And I, you know, I'm just shocked that more people don't, uh, uh, you know, aren't aren't up in arms with their representatives over something like that, especially folks in the lower income communities in the rural areas. Yeah, it's um, uh, it, it's it's surprising, although I mean, Natasha did a great job in the Senate finance in in perpetuating this myth that that PFDs are free money, right? And and it's and it's within government's right. And government should, in fact, go grab that money out of the pockets of Alaskans because it's free money. After all, you don't have any right to it. You, you don't have any expectation of it. Um, and she did a great job perpetuating that myth. And and I think I think that you know the Democrats sort of bought into that and said, oh yeah, well that's free money. Let's just let's just go let's go without thinking, or if they did without caring about the impact that it was going to have on, on middle and lower uh, income Alaska families. Uh, I mean, it's so, so they go to PFD cuts for two reasons. One, because it's easy. The money's coming through their fingers. It's easy for the legislature to divert it um, uh, over to whatever the hell else they want to spend it on while it's, while it's coming through their fingers. And the other thing is, and I think Zach Fields understands this better than most. The other thing is if if they raised it a different way, if they raised it through taxes or if they raised it through increased oil taxes or if they raised it through uh, any sort of non-regressive tax, a flat tax, progressive tax, they would trigger the top 20% because the top 20% have to pay for it. They would trigger the top 20% in pushing back on spending. So what they so what they've figured out is as long as we do it through PFD cuts and as long as we continue on with this fiction that it's just free money anyway. And, you know, we're entitled to it. It's a free ride and, and we're in, and government's entitled to it anyway. As long as they continue on with that, A, they they give cover to, you know, taking it while it's, while it's running through their fingers and B, they don't trigger the top 20%. So it's, but but now you've got Ben Carpenter. I I, I cannot tell you how uh, uh, respectful I am res uh, uh, of, of what Ben's done with, with putting the sales talk, tax out there. What you what you've got with Ben is he sort of called their bluff, right? He right. said, I, "I will see your regressive tax with a less regressive tax." Now, right. what are you going to say? Yeah, uh, and and they really and, and they're sort of like you know, it's regressive. That's what they're going to say. It's they're, regressive. There's they're still running around with this whole, you know, like Sarah Hannon, PFDs are free money, free rides die hard, and 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 you know uh, uh, some of the other responses of it's a regressive tax. But but the but the 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 uh, uh, hypocrisy of their position is becoming clearer now that Ben has laid out uh, a less regressive option and and I think people are saying I mean personally like, I don't know how he wrote that I don't know how you twist yourself in a pretzel enough to write something that attacks the 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 sales tax as being a regressive tool to to fill the budget a regressive and unacceptable tool to fill the budget at the same time you're saying we ought to be using PFD cuts. I, I, I mean, they're still, they're still trying to wrap themselves in that. But as we'll talk about in the second segment, finally, some people are you know, starting to get it. In addition to you and me yeah. are, are, uh, are calling them out. In reading that opinion, I'm like, wow, this guy obviously is seeing exactly the things that we're talking about. And I mean, <laughs> You're right. It it is it is so fascinating to watch and the justification hoops that they have to jump themselves through. Persilly, he's been that way for years, and I've seen it for years, and I've been pointing it out, and just now he just kind of walked it right over the edge, you know, kind of thing. Like, <laughs> there's, what? There's, 
there's not there's not even a semblance of logic uh in the argument that he's got in in the latest piece i we will see people like elise galvin and others try to try to you know twist this well i'm more progressive than i've i've got a progressive tax now i've got a i've got a progressive tax that i'm coming up with and they'll try tricks like that uh, but we just need to call we just need to keep calling it out and look at the substance of what they're proposing and calling it for what it is. I mean, hers is a fig leaf, uh, small tax on the top five percent, with a with, with leveling up with an even higher head tax on the other uh, on the other eighty on the other ninety five percent. Well, let's uh, give me a tease for number two. There is a difference between sales tax and income tax, as we've talked about. Uh, give me a quick uh, tease before we go to break. So Matt Berman, who is an ICER uh, economist uh, and one of the economists who worked on the 2016 and the 2017 uh, ICER studies, Matt doesn't come out of uh, doesn't come out of his office often in terms of public comment. But he wrote an op-ed uh, in the uh, in the ADN uh, over the weekend, well, late last week, that I think is an excellent op-ed. Uh, makes two points uh, that I think are very important to add to the discussion. One is sort of a repetition, but one is some new learning uh, that I think is important to add to the fiscal conversation. And uh, and I want to highlight that uh, in the second segment. Continuing now, Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. On to number two, we're talking about uh, sales taxes versus income taxes. There is a difference and uh, also a difference on the regressivity in dealing with the PFD tax as well. Um, some interesting opinion pieces out there, Brad, uh, go ahead and lay it out for it. Well, Berman's, uh, Matt Berman's piece, um, uh, in, in the late last week, uh, in the ADN, I think is a, I think is an excellent piece. Again, Matt was on the ICER team that did the two, uh, 2016 analysis that you and I talk about a lot. He also was the lead on the 2017 ICER analysis that looked at the impact of the various fiscal options on Alaska families and said clearly that the PFD cuts were by far, had by far the largest adverse impact on uh, on uh, Alaska families of, of all the various options. But Matt Matt sort of stays in his office and teaches his classes and doesn't come out very very often. He came out uh, in this opinion piece and I think uh, I think did a great job. A couple of, uh, one paragraph, there, there's two points that are in this piece that I want to emphasize. The first one is is captured by this paragraph. Let's be honest, a cut in the PFD is a tax, the most regressive tax ever proposed. A $1,000 cut will push thousands of Alaskans, Alaska families below the poverty line. It will increase homelessness and food insecurity. A low-income family loses $1,000 per person, while a high-income family loses about $700 per person because their federal income taxes drop. Progressives like Fields who advocate for using PFD cuts to pay for public spending should think again. And it's just, I mean, it's a, it's an excellent, it's an excellent piece focusing in on the impact of, of PFD cuts on, uh, on Alaska families. Matt also did um, a study of the impact of PFD cuts on poverty and on, and on what happens to Alaska, fam- whether it affects Alaska families from a poverty standpoint and concluded in that in that study, also in 2017, I think, concluded in that study that it pushed thousands of Alaskans uh, under the poverty line by by using PFD cuts uh, to uh, uh, to fund government. So it's, I mean, I think it's an excellent counterpoint uh, to uh, to some of the stuff that we've seen out there, Persley's piece and others uh, that talk about, you know, it's just free money. We ought to take it. There's no impact of it. Don't worry about it. We're funding all these government programs. They're good. Um, I, I think Matt is it, Matt's point is really brings out the the adverse impact of it. But there's a second piece in Matt's that I think I think is also important to focus on, and it's one that I that I have thought about in the past, but I never it never really rung with me the way it did while I was uh, uh, reading the uh, uh, reading Matt's piece. One of the one of the big pushbacks that Kathy Giesel, Josh Revac, and others have used in the past. Uh, against against uh, PFDs is that um, is that at the higher income brackets, PFD income is is subject to tax, obviously, and so a bunch of that PFD income leaks out of the state in terms of federal income taxes paid. Right, um, and and so their argument is, look, that's money we could be keeping in Alaska if we just cut the PFD. 
that's money we could be keeping in Alaska because it wouldn't leak out. Uh, if we, if we cut the PFD, kept the money in government, we'd keep the money in Alaska because it wouldn't leak out through federal income taxes. And that's been a point that I've heard a number of people, uh, argue over time as a, as a rationalization for why they favor PFD cuts, because it's a, because it stops, limits the, the federal income tax, uh, leakage. Matt's point, uh, in, in this piece is, is look, if you had an income tax, and you used the PFD as a credit to your income tax. So let's say you have a you have a state income tax of of five percent and or four percent, and the PF and you could use your PFD as to pay part of your tax. You could use use it as a tax credit against your tax. Um, it would offset your your state tax obligation. You wouldn't have to pay you wouldn't have to pay all that state tax. You would just contribute your PFD or take your PFD and use it as a, as a, as a credit against the PFD. Matt's point is if you use it that way, if you structure the, the state tax system that way, the PFD isn't taxed by the feds. It isn't treated as income by the feds. The, the, the portion that you use as a tax credit um, uh, stay is, is, is not income yeah. that, that then, right. that then counts in your federal, federal income tax. Right. So the, the leakage factor, the, the federal income tax leakage factor is a lot lower um, if you're if you're able to do that, because at the upper income at the upper income levels, um, you would use all of your PFD as a tax credit. You might owe some more on top of it, but you would at least use all of your PFD as a tax credit. So there wouldn't be any any federal income tax effect off of uh, the PFD. And that really, I think, I mean, so a lot of the money, a lot of the money that, that, that there's been the historic concern about it leaking out of the state, it wouldn't leak out through the federal income tax. It wouldn't leak out of the state. Right. That's different than the way a sales tax operates. You wouldn't be able to use the PFD as a credit against your sales tax. At least there's there's no state that that, that is set up to allow you to do that. Uh, you wouldn't be able to use the, the PFD as an offset against your sales tax. And so you would still have leakage, even if you even if you had a sales tax, and you were paying the sales tax uh, uh, to the state. When you received your PFD, when you received your full PFD, you would still have to pay a portion of that PFD. You'd still have to treat it as federal revenue and and treat it as uh, and, and pay a portion of it um, as federal income tax. And so you would still have the leakage uh, under a sales tax, and that would still be a problem uh, under a state sales tax. So Matt, I think, has raised an issue that's important, um, particularly for ways and means as they go through their process. I think it's an important issue to consider um, uh, in evaluating the difference between using a, 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 a sales tax and something like a flat uh, a tax and right. flatting, a flat income well, tax. I think, there's, I, think there's, I think there's the potential that significantly more money stays in the state under an income tax than would, than would stay in the state under a sales tax. Because well, yeah, it also prevents the leakage of the out of state, you know, out of state residents coming up here to work because it would it would uh, the tax would affect them as well. And they right. would receive no credit uh, because they're not Alaska residents as well on top of that. So, right. no, I mean, you know, if you want to again, you want something that's not regressive, you want something that hits everybody equally. Uh, I mean, there's a it, it is an idea. We're down to the last four minutes here, though, and I know you wanted to talk about oil taxation. Um, because we've got a couple different bills that are out there, including a bill on property taxes. I know there's been a discussion from Wolikowski on changing the oil taxation plan as well. You in the past have said that there's money left on the table for sure, uh, you know, to tax the oil companies to increase those revenues. What uh, what do you say here? Well, there's been I, I think there's I think the, I think the, the, the big picture is the oil taxes are moving. Uh, there was a hearing on it uh, last week. Uh, uh, Donnie Olson, uh, uh, co-chair of Senate Finance, has said there's going to be a committee substitute that will that will have oil taxes. Committee substitute usually means that the that the committee is treating it as seriously as ser as serious enough that that they're coming up with uh, with legislation. They're taking the time to come up with legislation to to consider uh, uh, moving forward. Um, Donnie did say there's three there's three components of of Wilikowski's bill. One is to close the Hillcorp loophole, which is a no brainer. Should have been done. Ten, five years ago, when every Hill Corp acquired BP, should be done hundred million dollars. The second is to change the credits uh, on the uh, on the way that the tax is calculated, the per barrel credits. Um, that needs to be looked at hard. 
Uh, Roger Marks has an op-ed piece in the Anchorage Daily News that says we need to, to evaluate that. We certainly do, because that's that you, you need to set that right to make sure we continue to get investment. But I think there's money there to reset that. And then the third piece of Willikowski's proposal is the so-called uh, ring fencing that you would isolate a willow cost to willow. They couldn't the expenses couldn't be used to offset Conoco's costs else, elsewhere. That's the most controversial. It's the one I think will, Conoco will push back on and saying, hey, willows. The willow economics are predicated in part on being able to use those costs to offset our, our tax expenses elsewhere. That's part of the economics underlying willow. And Donnie said at the hearing, Donnie Olson said at the hearing that the committee substitute likely would not include ring fencing, uh, which I think is I think is appropriate. It's maybe maybe we reconsider ring fencing at some point, but it's a step too far, particularly with willow. It's a step too far, I think, in the in the current reconsideration. So Oil taxes are moving. That's a good thing. We need to focus on Hillcorp. We ought to just do without even thinking about. We need to focus on the per barrel credits. And that we need to do some good analysis on about what impact increasing or decreasing the per barrel credits will have on uh, on investment levels and on the decline curve and, and, on, uh, and on future revenue streams. You can increase the tax, suffer some small loss in the decline curve, and make more money for the state, and we certainly should be doing that if if that's if the, if that's something we can do. Um, but we need to understand exactly what the impact is on the decline curve and, and and on investment levels, because you also can increase the tax, lose enough additional investment that you lose revenues uh, going forward, um, and and we need we need to avoid that. So we need to do as Roger suggested in his piece. We need to do some analysis. On, on what the impacts are of, of changing the old per barrel credits on, the, on, uh, on investment levels. And you've said in the past, and of course, that there is money left on the table, four or $500 million potentially. The ring fencing thing is an interesting debate, and I would like to see maybe a narrowing of that to only Alaskan properties instead of uh, worldwide and everything else. So, uh, but I, I want to, you know, we should talk about that again at a later date and the pros and cons of that. Just your back of the napkin estimates here at this point, uh, Brad. I mean, what do you think numbers wise? I mean, where would you think that you know, what kind of revenue could we talk about if we changed both the Hill Corp and the per barrel tax credit? Um, are we reaching upwards towards half a billion dollars? Is that uh, is that on the upper end or what do you think? Uh, well, Hill Corp's 80 to 100 million dollars. And that's um, that's pretty well clear. And because um, that's on the income tax side and um, corporate income tax side. And that's and that's pretty well not subject to much debate. The per barrel credits, here's the here's the issue on the per barrel credits. What impact do they have on investment levels? And if you can think in terms of decline curves, oil, if 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 here's today's production, and if you don't have additional investment or you have minimal invest, additional investment, oil production will decline over over this level. If if you decline like at, at this, if if you know increasing the per barrel credits by a certain amount results in sort of a nosedive, ten percent decline, then you may get more revenue in a couple of years. But over time, you're going to have you're going to have less revenue than you otherwise would have had you not changed the per barrel credits. If you change them and they only affect the decline curve by three percent, um, you're going to have a, it's going to change investment levels, and you and you only have a decline curve of 3% from where you otherwise would be, you're going to have a little bit less production than you otherwise want, but you're going to have more revenue because you're increasing, you're increasing the revenue on all the barrels up to, up to that decline curve level. Curve level. So the, the real, the, the question on the per barrel credits is what's the impact on investment levels and what's the impact on the, on the, on the decline level or on the, on the decline curves. And the, the administration previously last fall estimated that we could change the, the per bell credits by four dollar or three dollars something uh, uh, something in that neighborhood, and could get additional four hundred million dollars. That was slightly higher oil prices, um, so I'm not sure the four hundred million dollars is still the same. Maybe three fifty, uh, but you can change you can change the per bell credits to some degree, and and either not have an impact on the decline curve or have a moderate impact on the decline curve that gets you uh, gets you more money uh, long term. We need to have that. We need to have the debate about what that is. And we're probably talking about a half a billion dollars at current oil prices 
current and projected oil prices, we're probably talking about a half billion dollars long term between the per barrel credits right. and, uh, and, and additional Hillcorp. revenue. Yeah. Here's 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 the the thing about that debate though. The state really doesn't have the information you need to calculate the decline curves. The 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 companies largely have that information and largely don't have to produce it to the state. Right. So there, 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 there's got to be some process that either allows the state access to that information or, or puts the burden on the companies that you're either going to be taxed unless you produce the information. There's got to be some process we go through to get that information uh, out there where it can be analyzed and the state can have some feel for, for what the impact of those investment levels are uh, on the long-term decline curve. That, but, but that's the debate we need to have. So about half a billion dollars, roughly. What uh, about Cliff Grow's property tax increase? Any <laughs> any thoughts on that? So property taxes on oil companies are are just really sort of are, are just really sort of minimum taxes, right? I mean, they don't they don't vary depending upon the price of oil. They're just you got X amount of property, bam, you got you're going to pay X amount of tax. It's a way, it's a way of just having a a, a an increased burden on the companies without respect to without respect to uh, 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 without respect to volumes. But it, it needs to go in the calculation. You can probably increase uh, property taxes some, but then you probably can't increase the or, or decrease the per barrel credits as much as much as you otherwise would because to the oil companies, it's all the same, it's state tax. Right. And it's, and it's, in, and it's increased cost. So there's an interactivity between those two that uh, that needs to be evaluated before you just you know say, well, we can increase the... We can increase the per barrel credit or decrease the per barrel credit by X amount. That won't impact the decline curve. Then, if you layer property tax on on top of it, you may find out it does inc it does increase the decline curve. So you've got to you've got to you've got to interact. You've got to keep those two interacting. You can't just do both. Can't do both in the vacuum and say, well, you know, the one won't impact the other. We can just enact both, and we'll be we'll be fine. Right. The ring fencing, we don't have a lot of time here, but um, I thought that maybe a tightening of the ring fencing uh, where, you know, again, it was only Alaskan properties and not other places and things like that, you know, instead of the full picture uh, would be better. I know it's a I know it's a very volatile and very um, um, controversial type scheme, but, uh, you know, it, at least if they were investing in Alaska, they could write those investments off against, you know, current fields and things like that. Uh, in the state, just not somewhere else. There's, there's, you're, you're talking about two different tax schemes. So the, it's the corporate oil tax, the corporate income tax on oil companies that that allows consideration of costs uh, elsewhere. The, the the production tax doesn't allow consideration of costs elsewhere. The production tax is focused only on costs uh, for Alaska, and the ring fencing debate that that is raised in Wilikowski's bill is on the production tax. And so it is will, local already. Okay. Right, it is local already. So what Willikowski is saying is Willow costs ought to be kept with Willow. The, 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 the challenge of the current production tax is when you have a big new project startup like Willow, you got a bunch of upfront costs. And, and right now they can be used to offset, you know, revenues that are coming from elsewhere in the state and reduce your, 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 your production tax burden as a result of that. Um, what Willikowski wants to do is keep Willow costs with with Willow and not allow the not allow Conoco to use those costs to offset revenue uh, in other parts of the state. The problem is the Willow economics have been based upon, you know, being able to offset those costs elsewhere, use those costs to offset uh, revenue elsewhere in the state in calculating tax. So it's a it's a it's a challenge to think through how that will impact Willow. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you, my friend, for coming in. Good uh, good morning, good show, and thanks for uh, being part of it. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 2.